Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Inglebard Gaming. Today I've got the fourth installment of my Shining Force retrospective, in which I take a look at a little of the history and all of the plot of what is maybe the most beloved game in the series, Shining Force 2 on the Sega Genesis. Shining Force 2 was the second full game in the series, after the Genesis original and the two portable side story titles of Shining Force Gaiden 1 and 2 for the Game Gear, all of which have been covered in the prior three parts of this series. In October of 1993, a bit over a year after the original Shining Force for the Genesis slash Mega Drive, Sega released the full sequel to the original Shining Force. In Japan, the game was known as Shining Force 2 Ancient Ceiling, while in the US, it was just known as Shining Force 2. Now, we didn't see this title in the States until more than a year after its Japanese release, which crusty old gamers like me will know was a pretty common occurrence back in that era. It wasn't like today, 2023 as I record this, where most big games are released in multiple regions at roughly the same time, if not the exact same time. Shining Force 2 was the product of the long partnership between the Takahashi brothers, Hiroyuki Takahashi of Sonic Software Planning, and Shugo Takahashi of Camelot Software Planning. If you saw my retrospective on the original Shining Force, you'll remember that those two separate companies would later be merged into Camelot Software Planning. The characters were designed by Fumio Ida, who may be better known as Suezen, who was the character designer for the then-contemporary anime series Yamadan. Hiroyuki Takahashi, in an interview from 1993, which you can see translated on the excellent site shmoplations.com, linked below by the way, joked that the character design was so good it made the other parts of the game look weak by comparison. Don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Anyway, he also said that they improved the enemy AI and tried to make engaging and clever fights that would challenge experienced players without making the game overly difficult. In another interview of the same year, Hiroyuki credited his brother Shugo with dramatically improving the AI of the game, which is a smidge contradicted in a different interview where Shugo credits the main programmer with the AI improvements. Another interview translated by Shmoplations contains a roundtable with several of the development staff members of Shining Force 2. It's an interesting read and talks about who did what, how they arrived at chess placements in the maps, and plenty of other things. Maybe one of the most interesting bits was the development of Shining Force 2 started in March of 1992. However, most if not all of the team moved to Shining Force Gaiden and completed that first. When work was done, only one of the developers concentrated on Shining Force 2 full-time, while the other staff worked on Gaiden 2. Now, they worked on Shining Force 2 a little between Gaiden 1 and 2, and then focused on Shining Force 2 afterwards. All things considered, Shining Force 2 was worked on, on and off, for nearly a year and a half. The Takahashi brothers also state in that interview that, before compression, Shining Force 2 was about 80 megabits. They stated things had to be moved around on the cartridge like a jigsaw puzzle, combined with compression to get it to fit on a 16 megabit cartridge. And they also stated that there was only about 2 kilobytes free on the entire cartridge when all was said and done. Now interestingly, Hiroyuki Takahashi mentioned there was a lot of pressure on the team working on Shining Force 2 because the game was slated to come out roughly the same time as Final Fantasy V and Dragon Quest V for the Super Famicom, and it would in some ways be compared to those games. Now in Japan, those two titles were of course gigantic, so that pressure was understandable. He and the other developers also mentioned the infamous crunch time they faced with long nights during the end phase of Shining Force 2's development. Does Shining Force 2 stand on its own two feet amongst the contemporary giants of its genre or subgenre? I'll talk about that at the end of the video when I do a little mini review. At first glance, despite everything you just saw and heard, you might think that Shining Force 2 is nothing but more of the original and that nothing significant has changed at all. If that's what you're thinking, well, you're wrong! Sure, Shining Force 2 inherited plenty from its older brother, but there's a lot going on under the surface with this one. As I mentioned in the last segment, Shining Force 2 was on a 16 megabit cartridge, which in common parlance is 2 full megabytes. This is only slightly larger than the 12 megabit or 1.5 megabyte cartridge of the original Shining Force. Despite this relatively modest storage space boost, there's a much greater variety of background tiles, especially in towns. Some of the battle backgrounds look incredible. It's tough to believe some of these are pixel art in a little window of a 320x224 resolution screen. I mean, look at the trees in this battle background. Pretty incredible, right? 
There's also more parallax in the backgrounds and some other neat little effects like simulated sprite scaling here and there. If you look at the characters themselves, whether we're talking about their overhead sprites or their close-up encounter versions, you'll find they have a lot more detail than those of the first game. Another thing that's improved a lot is the sound. The music especially received a huge upgrade. Like the two Game Gear Gaiden titles, Motoaki Takanauchi has done the composition for Shining Force 2, and it has some really great, memorable tracks. No offense to the composer of the first game, Masahiko Yoshimura, but the tracks in this game are a lot more pleasant to listen to than those in the first Shining Force. There are way more digitized sound effects this time around, too. Now let's talk about gameplay real quick. While plenty of elements from the first game remain, like the town exploration, items, equipment, strategic combat, the experience system, and more, lots has been added to improve Shining Force 2 and make it simultaneously deeper, yet more user-friendly than the first game. The C button is now a context-sensitive button that will talk to characters in front of you or search the area in front of you, which is a huge time-saving improvement over the original game. While you're in shops, you can now also see the stat boosts from weapons and items before you buy them. Shining Force 2 has more hidden characters to find in the first game as well. The world is more cohesive, you can travel back and forth between areas of the game, and it's not broken up into chapters like the prior Shining Force games. Shining Force 2 is also much more story intensive and character focused than the original. Which will segue us into the next portion of the video. Like with the other videos in this series, I'll be doing a complete breakdown of every major battle, every location, and every story element of the game. So be warned, if you haven't played Shining Force 2 and don't want the game to be spoiled for you, then you'll want to stop this video right now. I'm going to try to keep this concise because the story of this game is longer than any of the other Shining Force games we've looked at so far. Still. Grab a snack, grab a drink, sit back, chill, or take breaks from the video if you want. This is going to be a long one. Now while Shining Force 2 is not divided into chapters in the game, I'm going to create my own segments based on parts of the game so it'll be easy to have natural stopping points if you want to take a break and come back later. And then be sure to stick around to the very end for my review of the game. Alright, let's get on with it. Shining Force 2 begins with a cutscene as soon as you turn on the Genesis, before you even get to the title screen. Watch it! It sets up the entire first part of the game, and if you skip it, you'll be a little confused as to what's going on. It's kind of weird that they didn't have the scene play right at the beginning after you start a new game, but that's how it is. In this scene, a humanoid rat-like thief and a few of his burly thief companions are in a temple of some kind, looking to pilfer some valuables as you'd expect from any thief. We'll see this character more in a little while, but I'll just go ahead and tell you now that his name is Slade. Slade and his party find a light and dark jewel in the temple. The big muscular thieves with Slade try to remove them one at a time, but can't. Slade then grabs both gems at the same time and yoinks them right on out of there. Immediately, some bad stuff happens. In Grand Seal Castle, the king and his advisor talk about the ominous storm going on and panic a little when the candles in the throne room blow out. A messenger shows up to tell the king that there's something wrong with the temple, which is apparently called the Ancient Tower. The king's advisor accompanies the knight to go find out what's happening at the Ancient Tower while the lightning storm rages on. Then the king is attacked by a monster of some kind. Shining Force 2 ditches the cute storybook motif for saving and loading game files. Instead, you're greeted by a witch stirring some nasty-looking brew. You get to name your character here, but since the character is canonically named Bowie, I went ahead and named him that for this playthrough. You also get to choose one of four difficulty levels. When you get into the game from here, you'll have control of Bowie as he wanders around the town of Grand Seal on Grand Island. He can read book titles on the bookshelves, talk to the inhabitants of the town, search vases, barrels, and anything else that looks suspicious. One thing you'll notice uh, gameplay-wise this time around is that the scrolling has momentum. It starts out slow and then gets faster as you approach the edge of the screen and then maintains a single fast speed. It mostly works well in this game since it doesn't really have any kind of action elements. Like the other games in the series, you still save, promote, remove poison, and curses at churches. Anyway, your first task is to go to school, talk to your teacher and adoptive father Astral, and then sit in your place while he teaches you the daily class. Astral also apparently cosplays Gandalf from Lord of the Rings like all the time. We also meet Bowie's classmates, Sarah the Priest and Chester the Knight, a centaur. Astral is then summoned to the castle because of the shenanigans from the opening. If you explore for a bit, 
You'll learn there's a neighboring kingdom named Galam that's allied with Grand Seal, and that Galam has a general that people look up to named Lemon. Yes, Lemon. Once you and your buddies sneak into the castle, you find Estral with the injured king and the king's daughter, Princess Ellis. Estral decides that all of you will go to investigate the ancient tower to see if something there can solve the mystery of the sick king. When we arrive at the tower, it's time for our first battle. You'll see right away that even on the normal difficulty, Shining Force 2 is noticeably tougher than the first game. This holds true for a lot of the game, but you can always brute force it by using egress to leave fights and start them over to grind a little bit if you want to make it easier. Anyway, Bowie and company take out all the smoke monsters led by one called Gizmo, and then head back to the castle. The king has apparently gone nutso and knocked out the princess. Gandalf, uh, sorry, Astral, casts a spell on the king, removing an evil spirit that possessed him. The king and his advisors send the Grand Seal army to go and find the evil Gizmo that had possessed the king and to kill it before it can possess anyone else. He then sends Bowie and his force to go find a man named Howell in a nearby village named Yeel. Howell is a historian who the king thinks can help them understand what's going on. On your way out, your missing pal Jaha shows up to join the force. There's another battle here, and it's pretty tough from the get-go. Don't be surprised if you have to get a few hits in, egress, and then come back a few times. And this game's overhead slime sprites look a lot more like tablecloths than living creatures, but what are you gonna do? Make your way through this battle. Afterwards, you'll discover and yield that Howell lives in isolation a little further away. Bowie and company meet up with Howell's student cousin, a mage, and then head out into another battle. I'm pretty sure this fight is random, but I decided to go ahead and do it anyway. When you arrive at Howell's place, he's basically in his death throes after having been attacked by two knights from Galam looking for Howell's notes on something called the Ground Seal. Cousin decides to honor Howell's last wish, which was to seal the tower. Since Bowie is headed in that direction, Cousin joins up with the Shining Force. On the way out of Howell's place, the force is attacked by Galam troops. General Lemon demands that they capture Bowie and company alive. But you're going to go ahead and do this fight. After you win the fight, Lemon shows up, knocks out Bowie, and he and the Galam army take custody of Bowie and the entire force. Bowie wakes up in a cell. Most of the force is with him, but Sarah and a few of the other people are in a cell next to theirs. They have a little chat through the wall, and it turns out that Slade, the thief from the intro, is also here. He tells the story about how he took the gems, not realizing what they were. It turns out Slade has a reputation for stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, and just made a bad decision. He breaks out of his cell, and then lets everyone else out of theirs too. Slade didn't want any of this bad stuff to happen, and everyone insists that it was not his fault. Even though, you know, I mean, it totally is. Anyway... Slade helps the Shining Force by telling them about a shortcut to avoid some guards, and then he goes with you, but he still hasn't officially joined yet. And gee, I'm so glad that Slade told us about that shortcut to avoid battling the guards, so now we can take the long way around in order to, you know, battle some guards. Win this fight and you'll retrieve the Light Gem, which attaches itself to Bowie's neck and can't be removed. Oh, and it turns out King Galam has the Dark Gem. Anyway, after that battle, make sure you upgrade your weapons here in Galam if you haven't yet, because as soon as you leave town, you'll fight another battle! And then after that battle, which we're just going to skim through here, you can head home. When you return to Grand Seal, you'll see that the Galam army has basically slaughtered everyone in the town and castle. That's dark, man. Oh, and don't miss out on the hidden character here. You get to name him whatever you want, but canonically his name is Kiwi, so I call him that. When you get to the castle, Lemon is begging Astral to back off because he doesn't want to have to hurt him. Astral insists to Lemon that King Galam is possessed and that Grand Seal wouldn't have ever attacked Galam because they're allies. They hear the princess scream and Lemon relents, and everyone runs to the ancient tower. Now this next battle isn't too bad if you've been keeping your levels up. Just keep your distance from enemies and try to take them out one at a time without letting any of them gang up on your characters. After a hard-fought victory, 
King Galam grabs the princess and floats up toward a giant door or something. Some of the good guys hilariously throw Bowie at him. Bowie grabs onto King Galam, who just keeps on floating away. The King's Dark Gem then also gloms onto Bowie and merges with the Light Gem. King Galam and Grand Seal's Princess Ellis fall away into the door or whatever that thing is. The King of Grand Seal is distraught, but the whole place starts to come down, so everyone wisely decides to GTFO. Once we make it back into the town, we see chasms opening up and the crazy earthquake continues and two helpful guards die right in front of us. All the survivors are on a ship in the dock. Bowie and company head to the ship and abandon Grant's Island just before this portion of it completely collapses. Everyone decides to go to the mainland on the continent of Parmesia. So the ship sails off for a while and eventually lands and everyone decides that they'll build a new home right there in the woods. It's decided they'll dismantle the ship and use the lumber to build houses and the new castle. While taking the ship apart, one of the townspeople goes missing. Bowie decides to help find them. This results in a big battle with some unfriendly natives. These enemies are tougher and this is another mini difficulty spike. Use egress if you need to. You might be tempted to split your force and have one half go north and the other go east. Don't. Stick together. Take out the lower enemies first, then head north if you want to do things the easy way. You're welcome. Also, quick note, the minimum level for promotion to a new class in this game is level 20. Most people will recommend waiting until level 25 or even 30 before you promote in Shining Force 2 to make the end game easier. Anywho, after you win this battle, it's back to the town with you. The town gets fully built up and a full year passes, making this a good place to end what I'll unofficially call Part 1 of Shining Force 2. And that's the end of that chapter. Everyone's gathered in the new makeshift castle to celebrate the one-year anniversary of arriving at their new home. The king is outright depressed about the princess and wants to return to the no longer there section of Grand's Island to find her. Astral decides that while the town and castle have come together nicely, they lack trading and they need to make alliances in this new land. When Bowie heads out into the new town, there's a commotion while everyone checks out some weird big bird. Turns out it's a tubby phoenix named Peter who's been injured and gets mocked by some of the town's kids while the adults just watch and let it happen. Good supervision, adults. When the children finish torturing the poor injured creature, you learn that his boss is a god named Volcanon. After a bit of a chinwag, guess who you're about to go off and meet? So you'll face a battle on your way to the town of Ribble that's generally off to the east. Be careful, the vampire bats here can each cast Blaze level 2 one time, which can kill Kiwi in one shot. Other than that, this battle is pretty standard. Once you arrive at Riddle, a resident gets scared of you and you see all the doors are locked. You make your way up to the mayor who chews you out until Peter pops in and brags about being a phoenix, after which everything is cool. Notice the giant tree in the center of the town with a hole in it. We'll be back here later. Also of note is a student historian who talks about needing the Achilles sword. Be sure to remember both of those things. And from this point on, make sure you're loading up on better weapons every chance you get. It can really make a huge difference. Now on your way out, you can pick up the centaur archer May, which I did. From there, you're off to meet Volcanon in the amazingly named Mount Volcano. You'll have another encounter or two along the way and expect to deal with some random battles from this point on as well. At this stage of the game, they're okay because frankly you'll need the experience and the level gains they provide, but you will outgrow them eventually. Make sure you save in every single town every time you go to them. That way if you hit a random battle that you don't want to do, you can just reload. Eventually, you'll wind your way towards this cave, which is where the next story battle takes place. Your view is limited like we saw in some battles in prior games, but it doesn't really matter since you can see everything by moving the cursor around. The enemies are a little tougher and there are more magic users to be careful of, but this fight isn't too bad. Make sure to pick up the silver tank from the chest before you leave if you want, as that'll come in handy later. Next up, Polka. That's P-O-L-C-A. And it's a village of various creatures like centaurs, wolfmen, birdmen, and stuff like that. It's at the base of the mountain where Volcanon lives. After some shakes and wiggles, you learn that Volcanon has been mad about something. Also, some weird blind kid named Oddler shows up and is taken to the mayor's house to recover from injuries he took before limping his way into the town. 
Anyway, load up on any new weapons you need before continuing on. We head into our next main story battle in the mountains with some lovely parallax scrolling backgrounds. The enemies are mostly a bit tougher here, but you should be able to handle them. Uh, but if you haven't been leveling Kiwi, you probably want to start doing that by now if you're playing along. So anyway, it's time to head into King Bedo's castle in the area known as, you guessed it, Bedo! Make sure you're searching all the vases and barrels for permanent stat increase items, consumables, and other special items. Bedo tells you all that basically Volcanon is kinda pissed at the people from Grand Seal, and tells Peter to go see him alone. But Peter's like, nah, it's all good, and tells you to come with him. He also says that someone from Grand's Island awakened the big bad devil named Zeon. That someone, of course, was Slade in the opening cutscene. So anyway, we reach Volcanon, and yeah, he's definitely pissed. He's so angry that he withdraws all his protection from the land. Which, considering all the battles on the way here, didn't seem to be doing much good anyway. Beyond that, he tells you to solve your own problems. And after Peter begs him to give you some advice, he tells Bowie that the gem around his neck is super important. At this point, Peter officially joins the Force and is controllable now, and he just might be the best character in the entire game, so you take care of that precious bird boy if you're playing. You'll thank me later. Also, a quick note about Peter, if he dies in battle, because he's a phoenix, he automatically revives after the battle. You never have to pay to revive him at a church. Nice. Anyway, let's head back to Polka to convince the mayor to give us a raft. When we arrive back in Polka, there's a big story battle. Geralt, the Wolfman, joins your force to help fight the baddies here. Take this battle slow, be careful. It might be a smidge tough, but you'll make it through. After this battle, Luke the Birdman accompanies us to go see the mayor. It turns out the mayor let the enemies in, and while he didn't give Oddler up, he was willing to. The mayor then apologizes and asks if there's anything he can do to make it up to us. Well, how about that raft? <laughs> The mayor gives us the town's last raft, much to the chagrin of its builder. After that, you can do what I did, which is nightmarishly wrong, or you can do things the right way. You see, it had been a while since I played Shining Force 2, and I forgot where to go next at this point. So I headed to the next story battle, which is on the raft. It's a battle with the Kraken. If you're playing, don't do this. You're supposed to come here later. But I'll show you how this fight went for me, since it was the order in which I did things. At this point in the game, the fight is really hard, and the Kraken's legs hit you for a ton of damage. You technically only have to beat Kraken himself, but realistically, you'll have to take out some of those legs before you even have a chance of defeating him. I struggled, I had to regress one time and then come back, but I beat it on my second try with lots of careful planning. Now the reason for the giant difficulty spike here was... I was supposed to do about four other battles before this one. Anyway, after the Kraken battle, I headed to Hassan. I picked up some weapons that were a little advanced for this point in the game, and that's when I realized that I'd screwed up, because Rode wouldn't even talk to me yet. I went west and realized, after another fight that seemed too hard, but I still managed to win, that I must have missed something. So I went back and found what I should have done prior to the Kraken battle. Now off to the east, we can find a little ruin with a couple of guys inside who mistake us for some clown named Petro. Remember that name, we'll see him later. One of them is older and has been looking for the Sky Orb that Petro has apparently stolen. But once he realizes that we're not Petro, we just talk to him again, and he says he'll come with us to look for the orb, in theory at least. We hop back on the raft and head to the cave south of Riddle. Once inside, there's a story battle. It was pretty easy for me, <laughs> but remember, I was over-leveled because of all the other stuff I did first, including a couple of random battles that I ran into. Once it's done, we pick up the stuff from the chests, and find a wooden panel in one of them. Once we have the wooden panel, we can head back to Riddle. We need to use the wooden panel in front of the tree. Now if you've been using the C button for context talking and searching, that doesn't work here, it just gives you the search result text. You have to press the A button to open your menu, and manually use the panel right in front of the tree. Lots of people got stuck here back in the day because of this little quirk. After that, some stairs open up in front of us that lead to the ruin that the guy near the tree had been looking for. When you go in, the only thing to pick up is the Achilles sword. Remember when I told you to remember that tree and sword earlier? 
after we pick up the sword, we have to go off to see Rode and Hassan. If you're doing stuff in the correct order, unlike me, this is the point where you should enter the Kraken battle on the map. If you already fought the Kraken and defeated it, you can just glide on through and head right into Hassan. Once in Hassan, buy any weapons you need if this is your first time here, and then head into Rhodes' house. He'll know you have the Achilles sword because he smells it with his mighty proboscis. He says you must be looking for the caravan, and only he can operate it. So, even though he wouldn't give us the time of day earlier, now he wants to come with us. But we're nice and we forgive him, and we're swell, so we take him along. We make sure to save at the church, and then I'll call this the end of part two. And that's the end of that chapter. Okay, for the next section of the game, we head west into the forest. There's a random battle right outside of Hassan. If you want to try to avoid it, just reload your save. Off on the left side of the screen is an ancient ruin with a giant robot inside named Taros, who we heard about earlier in the town of Riddle. For this fight, just apply some common sense. The Soul Sower enemies have pretty high defense, so keep that in mind. I strongly recommend taking out every enemy before you deal with Taros. Also, only Bowie will be able to damage Taros. You want to make sure both he and Sarah survive to the end, since she'll probably need to heal him after he takes a hit or two. Taros' range is pretty long, so make sure you're using heal level 2 to replenish Bowie from a distance when necessary. Once we defeat Taros, we pick up the caravan. It looks like Rode tries to steal it, but he's just testing it out, and then he comes right back to us. Now the caravan lets us do a few things. First, we can manage the active battle party and switch between members by using it. To activate it, press the C button while standing on top of it. Another handy feature is the depot that lets you store items you don't need immediately. You probably have some promotion items to special classes and mithril that'll come in handy later. You can drop those things into the depot for now. Now, I can't remember if anyone actually mentions this in the game or not, but you can also use the caravan to cross rocks in shallow rivers, and that's what we need to do next. We go to the next section either by going straight north from the screen with the ruin on it, or if you want to wander around a little bit first and do a battle or two, you can also get into the next area heading south from the new Grand Seal location. So basically, we want to end up in this area with this little cave where the rocks end. If we pop in there, we find out a miner is hurt and only a fairy can heal him. The fairy, as it turns out, is missing. She went looking for Creed's mansion. Go south of the cave and cross another shallow river, and you'll find a discolored tree in the forest. Stand on that square, and you'll find yourself in the hidden-ish elven town. Here we learn that the fairy has a friend, an elf, named Elric. He's apparently in the dangerous western forest, and may be the only person besides the fairy that knows the way to Creed's mansion. If we pop up to the second floor of the big house, we'll also find a little church. If you're playing along, save before you leave town. So right after you leave town, there's a chance of a random battle here. If you don't want to do it, reload it, but my advice is, probably do this one. There's a giant difficulty spike coming, and you'll want the experience. Now I'm holding off on promoting my eligible characters so I can try to maximize their late game stats. But if you find that the game is too difficult from here, and you have characters at level 20 or higher, you can promote them now. It won't make that huge a difference to the end game. Anywho, after you do that battle, or not, off to the west there's an area with a little pond. Oddler kind of freaks out and says he hears someone that needs help there. Great, Oddler. Thanks. I would have never figured out to step on that completely inconspicuous square without you. The battle here is really tough unless you've been grinding away. We'll encounter harpies here that hit extremely hard and have high defense. We also run into the next level of healers, mages, and warriors. Aside from the Kraken battle, which I accidentally did too early, this was the first battle that I lost and had to redo. My advice here is to concentrate your characters in the upper area first to take care of the two nearby harpies. You want four or five characters to be able to attack them on one turn so you can kill them as quickly as possible. After that, and we can move a little more freely, I suggest concentrating on the enemy priests since they have a high level healing spell. When we finally win, we rescue Elric from the pool. Elric happens to be an archer and he joins the force. Go to the caravan and put him in your active battle party. If you have any characters that are dead, head back to the town and revive them. Make sure to save in case you get stuck in a random battle that you don't want to fight. After that, head back to the pool area. A little cutscene happens where Elric does something and unlocks the path to Creed's mansion and the next battle. Quick note, 
this cave has some hidden chests in it. If you head all the way to the west, there's a fake wall to the south. Go south, and then head through another fake wall to the east, and that's where you find the chests. After that, leave through the northwestern exit, and you'll be in a battle just outside Creed's mansion. And ugh, this map gives me flashbacks to the first Shining Force. There are lots of movement restricting tiles like trees and sand. The enemies here are once again really tough, and the new skeletons are particularly strong and have high defense. If you've been leveling your force okay up to this point, you should be able to win this one on your first try. Just be ready to gang up on the tough enemies like harpies and skeletons in particular. You might want to regress and do this battle a few times to prepare for what's coming. Don't say I didn't warn you. So after that, we find the mansion and holy cow, Creed looks like LeChuck from Monkey Island. Yeah, he's one of the devils, but apparently he's an okay kind of devil. He's got a stooge named Goliath that helps take care of the mansion. Goliath spots you and tells you that Creed isn't seeing anyone now, and that you'll have to get lost. Peter and company decide that they'll just rush through the door, but Goliath then teleports in front of them and blocks their way. Peter and the Force then decide to tell Goliath that they're leaving, but instead sneak in through that other door on the left. They try it, and uh-oh, they shrink down to tiny proportions, and Goliath drops them off on the desktop in what's known as Desktop Kingdom, which sits atop Floor World. Now this is one of the more fun and memorable parts of the game. First off, there's a priest to the north to revive characters and save. Do both. You're trapped on this table for now, along with some other characters that you'll notice have portraits. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. You'll find that LeChuck, uh, I mean, Creed, is actually a pretty swell guy, and save these people from a disaster. Even better, they don't age while they're tiny. But a prison is still a prison, right? Everyone says to go to the king for help. So you talk to the king, and he tells you that he'll help you if you can beat the opponents on the chessboard. You agree, and holy shit, is there a difficulty spike right here and right now. The chess battle is insanely hard, even if you're pretty well leveled up at this point. It may even be the hardest fight in the entire game, no joke. So a few things here. It's possible to run out of money and make life super hard for yourself here. So I suggest starting the fight, trying to kill just a couple of enemies to gain some experience and save some money, and then egress and repeat a few times. Now, like real chess, you only have to deal with the king. Unlike real chess, you have to actually kill him. The chess piece enemies are unbelievably powerful. I'm still holding off on promoting my characters because I really want to have my guys at their max potential later. Now, if you're just stuck here and you can't win, promote your characters. They'll get better stat boosts from level ups and it will make this easier. So, everyone unpromoted, it took me three tries before I managed to win this one. Now, if you're stuck here, Here's my advice for winning this fight. Move all of your force to the right side of the board. Move your flyers off of the board on the right. Peter in particular should be pretty awesome by now if you've been giving him some kills. He's my strongest character already. Slowly move your strongest attackers up to position them so they can reach the enemy you want to attack first. Once everyone is in position and that enemy has had its turn come and go, throw everything you've got at them. When the bishops come over to heal the enemies you've been damaging, they should be your next main target. Watch out for the king and queens and their area of effect spells. Pawns are crazy strong. I suggest carefully moving Bowie in range during the fray to get off a couple of lightning spells. Don't divide your force too much and concentrate on the fewest number of enemies possible at one time. After an extremely hard fought victory, the king puts a chest on the board that has the cotton balloon which is what we need to get to Floor World. So we head to the bottom right corner of the desk, walk the plank, open our menu, and use the cotton balloon to descend. Now we're on the gigantic floor. There's a bunch more people to talk to here, and there's a hole in the upper right corner. Head into that, and you'll have your next fight, which has tough enemies, but is a million times easier than the chess fight. Once we win, we can head out of the maze, and just keep going north, and Creed eventually finds us and makes us full size again. We tell him our story, and he has us follow him down into the basement. Creed summons an evil spirit to find out what's going on with Zeon. And hey, the spirit tells us Volcanon's protection is helping preserve part of the world. Well, I guess he was doing something after all. Sorry, Valky. Nah, he's a dick, forget it. We also learn another good spirit or something named Metula 
has protected her own land, but something's happened to her. The spirit says Zeon has revived and is in Ark Valley, but he still isn't at full power yet, yada yada yada, JRPG trope yada yada. The spirit says it can't see Zeon, but might be able to see him if we had something that belonged to Zeon. Bowie steps up after Creed fails to remove his dark gem, and the evil spirit turns into Zeon, who we see for the first time. Zeon tells Bowie and the Force to deliver the jewel to him in Ark Valley, and that he'll trade Princess Ellis, who is apparently still alive, for said gem. After the seance-like experience concludes with Zeon exploding the evil spirit, we head back up the stairs, and Creed tells us to go see the storytellers in Tristan, that one of them might know something helpful. The fairy also wants to go with us to help that sick dwarf from earlier. On the way out, those characters that had the portraits from before on the desktop come into play. You can pick one to join the force right now. I took Karna the Priest since I wanted another healer. And don't worry, you can get the others later if you want. Also of note here is that Odler stays behind with Creed, and we're told we'll find out the reason why later. Swell. And that'll finish up what I'll call Part 3. And that's the end of that chapter. We pick things up returning to the hidden town and doing some party maintenance. From there, it's time to take the fairy to heal the worker in the cave. We go ahead and do that. The worker wants to thank the fairy, and the fairy says he can help her by helping the Shining Force. What a stand-up tiny gal. We get a cannon, which we'll need in just a few minutes. Our next stop is the new Grand Seal town, and we can get there just going north along the rocks in the river. In Grand Seal, we can see quite a few things have changed. The house in the bottom right corner is finally finished, and wow, that was kind of a letdown. It's just a plain tiny house. Oh well. We have to go see the king and company. We relay the news that the king's daughter Ellis is still alive, and he is obviously super ecstatic to hear that. We relay the entire story of what's happened in Sepiatone for some reason, and then we set off to go to North Parmesia and the town of Tristan to see the storytellers. Astral convinces the king to allow him to accompany us. But don't get too excited, he just joins as an advisor, he's not a playable character. We can finally get the dynamite from the guy next to the weapon shop, and we need to do that. If you tried to get it earlier, you wouldn't get it from him. That done, we can head off to the nearby blocked off cave and blast the rocks out of the way. On the way out of town, Elric's girlfriend Janet, who is also an elven archer, joins the force. On the way to the cave, we get into another battle. It flashes like it's random, but I'm pretty sure it's actually not. I tried reloading a bunch of times and couldn't avoid this one. If you haven't promoted characters yet, which I have not as you can see, this is still going to be pretty tough. And if you're wondering why I'm holding off on promoting these characters till you know, level 25 or 30, it's because the stats from their base class carry over. So you can basically end up with like an extra 5 to 15 points per stat after promotion if you wait. So yeah, like I said, I'm trying to hold off on promoting everybody until they reach around level 30, which will give them the maximum stat bonuses they can possibly have when they start their new class. So we finish up this fight, and then we head to the cave in the upper right corner of the map. Once we get to the cave, there's a little cutscene. Rode destroys the rocks, and then takes the cannon and joins the Shining Force as a playable character. He also comes pre-promoted, so yay for that. If anyone died in that last fight, head back to Grand Seal and revive them, since as soon as you go into the cave, the next battle begins. Of course, you can always just egress from the next battle right away also, whatever floats your boat. This cave has a limited field of view, just like the one from earlier, and the enemies here are about the same as the battle we just completed. Uh, make sure you watch out for the lesser demons. They'll hit us with an area of effect blaze magic, and they have enough magic points to do it twice. They're extra annoying, especially if you have unpromoted high-level characters in the fight, because you won't get much experience from them. Quick note, I've fallen behind a bit on getting some characters' levels up, especially Kiwi. Kiwi gets pretty powerful when promoted, but I'm really trying to hold out. If you're stuck and you just can't finish this map, I'd say at this point, you're probably alright to start promoting everyone that's level 20 or higher now. It can be worth it to hold out just a little longer if you can. I mean, we made it this far already, right? So we finish up this fight, grab the chest in the upper left, and then exit near the upper right area of the cave, and finally reach North Parmesia. Go ahead and enter the village of Keto. This is a funny little stopover. We can see that there's something going on with Metula, and the devils apparently really love putting out signs all over town. 
Go ahead and read them all. Disappointingly, there's no weapons for sale in this town. And also, despite the church being quote-unquote closed, we could still talk to the priest and use all his services. After checking things out and learning that the devils are really screwing with these people by telling them they're not even supposed to leave their houses, we're done for now and can head out. Once we leave Keto, we immediately enter the next battle. There's a short cutscene where we see Higgins, a knight from the town of Pakalon, is accosted by a fancy-looking devil. Higgins was apparently headed to South Parmesia to look for help with his country's fight against the devils. The devils here kill both of Higgins' companions and then try to possess him. The fancy-looking devil here is one of Zeon's leaders named Geshp. Astral is having none of that possession bullshit and the next battle begins with Higgins strewn out on the ground. There are some higher level enemies here. I went ahead and did most of this fight and then egressed before the end after I got Bowie up to level 30. I then revived everyone, promoted Bowie, Peter, and a few of the other characters. Like the other games in the series, after promotion, stat gains are higher. What's really cool at this point in the game, if you've been holding out, you'll see your newly promoted level 1 characters now gain more experience for fighting the same enemies that barely gave your level 20 plus base characters anything. They'll start going up levels fast, which is awesome. You'll be amazed at how much better they get. Oh, and Kiwi? He changes into a monster class, and he can fly even though it doesn't look like it. He starts gaining more hit points, and he gains a random breath attack that can also do a ton of damage and one-hit kill a lot of enemies at this point in the game. If you give him cheerful bread when you find it, suddenly he goes from being useless to one of your better characters at this point. So I hold off on promoting the other characters here, we'll get to them soon enough. Back to the battle outside the town, only this time it's much easier. Check out Peter the Phoenix with his new promotion graphic by the way. He looks awesome now, unlike his derpy looking little base class. Remember earlier when I said Peter was one of the best characters? His level ups will be insane from this point on for quite a while. And check out Kiwi, you go little monster! So we finish up this fight and move on. Astral saves Higgins, exercising the evil spirit before it takes hold. We confirm Higgins was coming south to try and find help, and he joins the force. He's already promoted and pretty high level at that, so you might just want to use him right away. He asks us for help with Pakalon, but we tell him, Tough shit guy, we're on the way to Tristan. He agrees to come with us anyway. To torture him a little, I decided to stop at Pakalon first anyway. Finally, we can get some decent new weapons. We leave Pakalon and then head north to our next mandatory battle. I won't waste much time on this one, it's pretty standard. And there are wyverns now. And what a word, right? Did you know in British English, the preferred pronunciation is wyvern, while in American English, the preferred pronunciation is wyvern. I looked it up a few months ago to settle an argument unrelated to Shining Force 2. So, wyvern it is, I guess. Anyway, Take out all the enemies here and then move on. Once we're done with that battle, we head to the bridge in the upper right corner of the map, and the next battle begins. There's a girl on the bridge filled with monsters who are trying to destroy it, and apparently, also, her. Something seems a little bit off though, right? Why does it look like the devils are just ignoring that girl in their midst? Anywho, enjoy the lovely parallax scrolling in this fight. This battle's difficulty is moderate, but the new worm enemies hit really hard, and can also poison our characters. I decided to try and get a few more of my base class characters some more experience before promoting them, and to really work on powering up some of my mainstays. Aside from the worms, the rest of this battle is pretty easy if you have mostly promoted characters now and have raised them a few levels. We finished the battle and saved the girl. Astral seems to want to deal with her himself and keep everyone else away. What a dirty old man. Oh, wait a minute. That's no ordinary girl. Yes, we're shocked to discover it's one of the leaders of the Devil Army, named Camila. We can see the translation is pretty poor in parts of Shining Force 2, and this conversation is one of them. The grammar is weird, the flow of the conversation is just unnatural, and it, it kind of hurts some of the context. This was something that was still very common in RPGs from the mid-1990s. Now, it doesn't ruin the experience or anything, but it really does stick out. Anyway, after that little cutscene, head north to Tristan. And I'll call that the end of part four. And that's the end of that chapter. We arrive in Tristan. I really like the design of this town. The large inclines give it some character, and you walk so fast 
They don't even hamper movement. Tristan is full of all kinds of creatures. We're told up front that the goddess Metula rules here and they have no king. Okay then, don't see why you had to mention a king at all really, but whatever. We explore the town, talk to everyone, and pick up a few new weapons before heading into the center area of the large building at the north edge of town. Once we do that, we head straight up the middle, and after some minor shenanigans, we start the next battle. First up, you might notice a chest on a small island in the water towards the western center of the map. Guess what? You can't open it in the US version. You can only open that chest in the Japanese version. It had a shining orb in it in the Japanese version, so no big loss, I guess. Aside from that, this is a pretty straightforward battle. Enemies hit pretty hard, but your defense and hit points should be improving at a much higher rate now than they were just a few battles ago. Just watch your positioning and look out for enemies that can one-hit kill your magic users. You really need to make sure from this point on that you have your mages and healers hang back a little bit. With that in mind, just stick with it, take out all the enemies. After you win this fight, we have a cutscene where one of the devil leaders tells you to enter the big door in front of you. And you'll want to go back to the church if you need to revive anyone, otherwise you can head straight into the next battle. The next cutscene begins with Astral talking about how ugly Zalbard is. Not cool, Astral. You're no prize yourself, buddy. Still, Zalbard is a bad dude, and he's done something to Metula that's caused all sorts of problems for North Parmesia, so he needs to go. I found this battle to be relatively easy. Just employ the usual techniques and it won't take long to get through it. Be careful around Zalbard, of course, but that's really the only one thing to be especially concerned about here. Once you defeat him, Zalbard dies, some elemental orb rolls onto the ground, and Metula emerges from the statue to the north of the shrine. Metula isn't exactly super helpful. I'm assuming that a bit of her character was lost in the mediocre translation here. If any proficient Japanese speakers can tell me about how she comes across in the Japanese version of the game, I'd really be interested to hear about that. Anyway, the most important thing we learn from her is a big lore reveal. It turns out that Grand Seal is actually the ancient tower that we got to know in the first game. And it's also in Ark Valley, which, hey, that's the place we have to go. And it was named Grand Seal because it seals the ground. Wow, how original. Metula has better things to do than help us save the world, though. But before she pieces out, she tells us that Zeon can't be killed, only weakened. If we weaken Zeon, she and Volcanon will come to help us. Great, don't let me put you out or anything. She takes off, and we're off to find the Storytellers, which are very nearby. As in, we get to them from this area that we're in right now. There's a door on the left that leads to an extra character you can pick up, Taya the Sorcerer. There's also some chests to loot. Upon completing your plundering, head back into the shrine and then across it to the door on the right. And here we have the storytellers, which are basically tombstones, I guess. They tell us some stuff we already learned, like to attack Zeon with the Holy Sword, that Ark Valley is where the King of Devils lives, and so on. But we also get what seems to be a cool connection to the first game. We learn that Dark Soul and Dark Dragon from the first game all fought against Zeon for control of Ark Valley. Zeon defeated both Dark Soul and Dark Dragon, but the duo managed to seal Zeon's powers away into the Dark Gem, or Dark Jewel, that is currently stuck on a mithril chain around Bowie's neck. Zeon lost his power and fell to Earth, creating a giant crater. The grieving god of wisdom created the Jewel of Light, which chose a brave man to fight the devils and armed him with the Holy Sword. The man with the Holy Sword fought the Demon Kings and defeated them. Who was that man? Well, it seems to me like you can make an argument for it being Max in Shining Force 1, even though they don't come straight out and say that. But connections between RPG titles and a series are always nice. Now, I do know that some of the things were kind of messed up in the translation here, especially about the nature of Dark Dragon, and I'd suggest, you know, reading up on the story if you're interested on that. It's a little bit beyond the scope of what I want to talk about here, but let's just say there are some contradictions. Getting back to the game, we also learn that a great evil sleeps inside Ark Valley after it was sealed by the hero, which, well, duh, that's where Zeon is. After the big lore dump, head back to the town and do any party maintenance that you need to, and then head off to Pakalon to move the story along. We go to the throne room and talk to Freja. He tells us that he's sealed the gate leading to Mound, which stopped some of the devils from crossing into Pakalon. He wants to go with us to try and save the people that are still there. And a quick note on him, he's a vicar already, but he only comes with two spells, Heal and Detox. You'll want to get him up a level or two, because he'll learn Aura, which is a great area of effect healing spell. That'll come in super handy from this point forward. 
Save at the priest in the upper right area of the castle before you exit, because a battle will start right away. And look, it's our pal Geshp again. He's the one who tried to possess Higgins just a little while ago. He wants Freja's key so he can open the gate to Mound. Uh, why doesn't he just wait since he must know that that's what we're trying to do anyway? Who knows? Geshp summons Camilla, the woman we met on the bridge just a short time ago. Camilla refuses to help him and kind of hilariously says she won't do it because she hates Geshp. She then teleports away, although she does leave him her army. So now, the Force starts to realize that these enemies are divided and competing against each other for some reason. Geshp taunts us a bit and then teleports away himself, saying he'll let the enemy goons finish us. Ugh, fat chance. This fight is pretty easy. The biggest issue on this map is just working around all the buildings in the town. They block a lot of movement, so you'll need to be careful not to get trapped in a bad position that you can't get out of. All the usual stuff applies in this battle. Be careful about positioning, keep the weak characters away from enemies, since they might die from a single hit. You know the drill by now. When we get outside the town, we head north. The gate to Mound is at the northwest corner of this map. We could have visited the gate earlier, but not done anything. It's just a locked door until you have Frasier with you. As soon as we enter this area, the next battle begins. It's another fairly simple one. The battles have been getting steadily easier since promotion, since some of these characters have become outright tanks. Anywho, when the battle begins, an enemy says he was ordered by Geshp to kill just a few of you, but he's gonna kill all of you. Instead, we decide to murder every single devil on this map. Oh, and a Pegasus Knight named Jaro from Galam joins us mid-battle. The computer controls him during battle, but we get control of him right after. When we're done murdering all the enemies, we move on to the upper left corner of the map and the gate to Mound. Freja opens the gate after warning us that there are devils inside, and in we go. Freja sees the towns empty of people and only devils remain. He joins the force officially here and automatically gets put into the battle party. Keep him in your party. You'll want him to get the aura spell. This town battle is much like the last one in Pakalon. Just employ the things you've learned up to this point and you'll get through it pretty quickly. After the battle ends, we meet a strange character named Zink under a rock. We see there's a staircase under the rock, and Zink tells us that there are more survivors from Mound down there. We also learn that Zink is very, very old. And then there's another dwarven gladiator there named Gion, and he'll join the force if you talk to him. You can optionally have a picture of Bowie painted and then look upon it, which I don't think actually does anything else. Anyway, there's a few items in some of the vases and uh, barrels here, and if you go back out into the main town area, there are people there now. Also, a church and shops. So go ahead, do any party maintenance that you need to, and save before leaving to the left or western side of town. Just a little more west, and we find the Nazca Ruins, which looks kind of like the Nazca Lines in real life. Look them up if you've never seen them. There's a giant bird on the ground, essentially. And Camila is here. Swell. Geshp shows up while Camila tells you to get ready to party. She and Geshp get into a little argument. Astral says if we defeat her, we can get the ship that's here and return to what's left of Grand's Island. So, off to battle we go. This map is kind of interesting for more than just its design since it's wide open and there isn't much terrain that really impedes your movement. So move deliberately, getting enemies into range, and then hitting them with three or four of your characters in one turn to take them out as quickly as possible. Keep your characters spaced apart when you can, and make sure you're healing as you need to. As far as bosses go, Camila is a pushover if you can isolate her. As always, be extra careful to make sure Bowie doesn't get killed, which should really only be a danger if you completely isolate him now. Once Camila is defeated, she gives us the Sky Orb, which we'll need in just a moment. She tells us we can use it to control the Nazca ship. Nice. She starts to warn us about Geshp and his prism flowers, saying we'll need to be careful when, just at that moment, Geshp shows up and burns her to death. How uncouth. Geshp says that their law is that traitors die by fire. He then taunts us to come to Grands, which was the plan anyway. Again, Zink warns that prism flowers are dangerous. Yeah, I think we all kind of figured that out. Now before we move on, if Geshp can just burn people to death, why hasn't he done that to literally everyone in the Shining Force? I sure don't know. Anyway, we have to head into the little eye of the statue, get the weapon from the chest, and then use the Sky Orb on the control panel. The Nazca lines suddenly elevate off the ground and start flying over the ocean. Zink is in control. We switch to a cutscene with Geshp talking to Zeon. Geshp asks for Odd Eye. Hmm, sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Zeon says Odd Eye is still damaged from battle and to take the Red Baron instead. Someone dressed in red, hmm? Interesting. Anyway, Geshp is going to shoot the Nazca ship down over the cape using his prism flowers and then ambush the Shining Force. 
What happens next? Gep shoots the Nazca ship down over the cape using prism flowers and then ambushes the Shining Force. Well, sort of. When we're shot down, we end up in a little empty area, but if you look closely, there's a tiny building off to the bottom left. Go in there and you'll see it's a training grounds for monks. More importantly, the head monk functions like a church, so you can revive, save, promote, whatever. And uh, I didn't get her, but apparently you can recruit Sheila the monk here. Anyway, we'll call that the end of part five. And that's the end of that chapter. We go west one screen and start a battle with some pretty tough enemies. We're introduced to Griffins here. This battle is straightforward without any kinds of tricks or gimmicks, just a whole bunch of high-level enemies clustered in one spot. You want to try to get your strong, high-mobility characters out in front to get in some early attacks and uh, take some damage while other characters slowly move into range. The one thing that does happen towards the end of this battle is that when you start moving your force members into the lower left corner of the map, you'll see mud men start to spawn in. And they suck because they hit hard and they aren't worth much experience. Anyway, it shouldn't be too tough to finish this one up. So next we'll see the town of Roft and we'll head in there. The villager mistakes us for Galam Knights, but you tell him, no, we're cool, and he's a trusting soul, so he just believes us. You can pick up some new weapons here, but you'll have seen most of them before. If you talk to the townspeople, you'll learn that there's a dwarven blacksmith that works with Mithril nearby. Hey, you probably picked up some Mithril earlier in the game. I've definitely got a few chunks saved up that I've been hauling around for a while. We'll come back here later, though, in part 7. We learn that someone named Petro came from the south, as did someone named Passeron. Petro. Hey, we heard that name a while back, remember? Now we learn that the devils kidnapped Mr. Petro and stole the Nazca ship. Bummer. We go into a building and see Passeron and Mr. Petro. Guess they didn't kidnap him very well, but those devils did hurt him a whole bunch, and he dies right in front of our little eyes. Double bummer. But witnessing Petro's death sends Zink into a tizzy and forces him to override his programming, allowing him to fight, and thus he joins the Shining Force as a party member. He's strong, but his movement is garbage. You might want to give him a running pimento if you have any and you plan to use him. And hey, look, there was a point in coming here. Anyway, now that we've activated Zink, we're done here. Let's move on. Also note at this point, you may have become attached to some characters if you've been using them for most of the game. But if you want to maximize your force, you'll want to switch out some old characters for some newer ones, since they do have better stats, better growth, or both. I know emotional attachments can be hard to break in games like this, but the end game is going to be pretty tough, and you'll want to go into it with the strongest possible characters. So to continue the story, we head west, then south a smidge, and enter this little clearing in the forest, which begins our next major battle. Geshp is here, and upset that we've arrived a bit early. But no matter, he says. He already finished making all his preparations. This map has a major gimmick going on. If you have weaker characters still, it's gonna be tough for them. The trick here is that there are prism flowers all along the map, most prominently to the south and in the center. But there are a couple off to the west end of the map also. Prism flowers can fire in a straight line across the length of the whole map. If you aren't careful, you can take a lot of damage from them. Always look around the map to make sure you're positioning your characters so they are not straight across from a prism flower, either horizontally or vertically. And also when they fire, they'll hit both friend and foe, kind of like the laser eye from the first Shining Force title. Except, you know, there's ten of them in one small map. Use your flyers to take out the ones on the west side of the map. It'll make life easier. Then just stay out of the range of the rest of them while you take out normal enemies, and then concentrate on the prism flowers as you can later on. Every hit is worth a decent amount of experience, and kills are worth a lot. So I suggest taking out all of them to maximize your character's growth. Be careful when you get to the tougher enemies in the southwest portion of the map, and you'll be set. Gesp shows up at the end, and is distraught that you've ruined all of his beautiful prism flowers, and says he's going to sick the Red Baron on us. Woo, Gesp, I'm so scared. If we head south through this screen, another battle begins. But a side note, you can travel back to South Parmesia from here if you want to. If you head south this way and cross a bunch of bridges, you end up in a cave which is really an ancient ruin. Travel through it and you'll eventually find your way to the cave that's just south of Riddle near New Grand Seal. If you missed anything or want to do anything that you just skipped earlier, this lets you head back to whatever you want. You don't have to go back to do anything, it's just there if you want to. It's especially likely that you missed a character or two you might want to recruit, but at this point, that would involve a lot of grinding, so it's probably not worth it. Anywho, let's move on with the game. When the next battle begins, Geshp is on about his prism flowers again, saying that we'll pay for destroying them. 
and we're introduced to the Red Baron, and he looks very familiar. He looks a lot like a certain fruit named General from earlier, doesn't he? Gesp says his armor is red because it's smeared with the blood of the many enemies he's killed. Scary. Or, you know, not. Just past the Red Baron is Galam, which we need to head into next, so a fightin' we will go. Movement is kind of limited on this map because of all the brush and water. If you've been playing the game yourself, you probably have it all figured out by now. Just utilize your strong flying characters, setting them to take out foes before they reach you from the periphery. Concentrate moving your force southwest while protecting the weaker characters like normal. Your tougher folks should be able to take between 2 and 5 hits now before they die, so you should have some breathing room to keep them away from healers for a little bit. Now do be ready to send them back to healers when you need to though, you don't want them to die if possible. Now I'm making extensive use of Kiwi, he can take a pounding from physical attacks, but level 4 magic can one hit kill him. So know your character's weaknesses and observe the environment before setting them off on their own. So keep all that in mind. And then once we take out Red Baron, and we break off his mask, and it turns out, hey look at that, it's Lemon. Who'd have thunk it? Lemon is sickened by all the people he's killed while under Zeon's control. Astral tries to console him and tells Lemon that it's not his fault. Lemon decides that he has to die to atone for all of his sins, and he runs off to the south. Astral says it won't be easy for Lemon to die because he's a vampire now. Hey, we heard about those earlier foreshadowing. So we head into Galam. If this place looks familiar, it's because we were here before in the early part of the game, way back near the beginning. Now the townsfolk have different things to say now, and you'll find a hole that Lemon made when he apparently tried to kill himself by jumping off a very high wall. He got up out of the hole and ran away because of that whole vampire thing he's got going on. We're told the priest at Yil liked the piano. Hmm, that sounds totally random and not like something that we'll need to know about five minutes from now. Anyway, if you need to revive anyone, there's a church in the castle. Uh, you might want to save here because remember, egress in this game takes you to the last church you saved at, no matter how far away it is. Go ahead and leave town through the southern exit when you're ready. The game goes to a cutscene with Gesp talking to Zeon. Zeon's none too pleased that Bowie defeated Red Baron. Zeon asks if his soldiers are really so weak. Gesp says yes! I mean, no! They're strong! They're just dumb and were outsmarted by Bowie! Zeon angrily tells Gesp, no more excuses! Either Gesp kills Bowie next time, or Zeon will kill Gesp. Gesp says that he'll win. He stakes his life on it. Uh, Gesp, you don't have to stake your life on it. Zeon already told you he'd kill you if you lose. Ah, well. After Gesp heads out, Odd Eye shows up. And there's something kind of familiar about Odd Eye, too, isn't there? Zeon tells Odd Eye that if Gesp fails, it'll fall to him to kill Bowie. We take a step or two once we have control again, and the next battle starts. Gesp shows up here, and he's going to fight us himself this time. We can also see the ancient tower in the southeastern portion of this map. Gesp lets the Shining Force know that he has to kill them, or it's his own head this time. Now this fight has a major gimmick in it. At first, it seems like a normal fight with tough enemies, but as the fight goes on, burst rocks will spawn in at various points. Burst rocks are not normal enemies. They're dangerous in two ways. First, when you land the killing blow, they'll explode, damaging anyone in a two-square radius. They can also choose to explode at any time. Ideally, if you're killing them, you want to use someone with a ranged attack to land the killing blow from three spaces away with no allies nearby to get harmed by their explosion. But realistically, that just isn't always possible. It's probably better if you have a healer that has aura nearby to take care of any injuries resulting from the explosions. Also, Gesp himself has really powerful attacks. With all the burst rocks and other enemies around, make sure not to put Bowie in a situation where he can get killed, causing you to lose the whole battle. So use your strong attackers and magic users to finish off Gesp, and this fight will be over in no time. And after we're all done, we stop short of landing the killing blow on Gesp. Why? We've watched him flat out murder people! Oh well, it doesn't matter, because as he slinks off, Zeon burns him to death, giving him what he deserved, finishing him off in the same way that Gesp had finished off Camilla. If we continue south, we'll run into the next fight, but there's some stuff we can do here first. We should head west to Yil. When we enter the town, we find Lemon on top of a tall cliff. He leaps off trying to kill himself again. Oh, that wacky Lemon. Estral warns he can't die right now since he's a vampire, but says that probably still hurts him. And if we look at the hole, Lemon will pop halfway out. And, oh look at that, hey, if we go around town, there's a piano. If only someone had said something about a piano earlier, oh hey, let's play it. We do that and get a nice little 
little song. And if we head west and north a smidge, a priest emerges from a house and thinks we're devils because he's apparently very stupid. Then Chaz shows up, who it turns out is Howell's son, who is also a historian. Howell was the guy that was killed by the Galam Knights near the beginning of the game in Kazin's Mentor. And that happened right near here, in case you forgot. We go into the basement to have a little chat. Astral relays our story to Chaz. Chaz understands we're looking for the Sword of Light. He remembered reading about it in one of his books. He finds the book, but the pages talking about the sword have been removed. Astral says we'll have to rely on Bowie's instincts. Uh, okay? After all that, Chaz joins us. He's a decent level wizard. I made the hard choice to replace Kazin with him, since Chaz's spells were just a little bit better. Now head out of the town to the south, and Lemon decides to join us too. He still wants to die, he just wants to die fighting the devils now. Sure, what harm could a suicidal maniac that just recovered from being brainwashed by the evil lord, during which time he murdered loads of innocent people possibly cause? Welcome aboard, Lemon! Now let's go to that next battle to the south of Yield. This one's pretty standard. A bunch of nobody enemies want to replace the generals that all died by Bowie's hands and become greater demons themselves. This is just a bog standard fight with strong enemies. So here's a quick look at it. I guess the only thing I'll mention is watch out on the upper right section of the screen. There are some enemies that will sneak up behind your force if you don't send a few characters to deal with them before they reach you. Other than that, this one's pretty simple. Once you take all the enemies out, head to the cave that's in the central southern part of the map. You can find a cursed evil axe in the chest. What you want to do is go down the stairs and into the room that has a sword and a stone. If you press the C button to search, it tells you it's the Sword of Light, but you can't actually pick it up. You have to press the A button to open the menu again and manually search using the command from the menu, and then Bowie will pick the sword up. Gee, thanks for making that part stupid, developers. Again, I knew people that got stuck on this part back in the day, and I understand. So we equip the sword, and we walk around to the right side to this tiny little building near the ancient tower. If you see button search, it's a demon head. Yay! However, if we open the menu with the A button instead, we can use the sword of light on it and cause it to open up. So I do that, but I don't go in yet. Because now that I'm here with what I think I'm going to use as my final party, I'm going to head just slightly back and do one more thing before coming here to start the end game. Thus ends part six. I begin this final section with a detour. Remember how I told you we could go back to Southern Parmesia just a bit ago? Well, let's do that to tie up a loose end. I'm gonna go back to the cave where we saved the dwarf earlier in the game, just south of New Grand Seal. It looks empty, but if we search the fire pit, we'll find the dry stone. That's all we want here. We have one more pit stop that's on the way back. Once we get to the large area of the ancient ruins, the golem with the missing arm is here. Let's give him his arm back and recruit him. He's got pretty decent stats but his HP are pretty low at this point, so I'll keep him out of the party for now. But I want to make one more stop. Back on Grand's Island, we have a little area I told you we'd be coming back to later, with a discolored tree in the forest. It looks like we can't get to it, right? But if we use that dry stone we picked up on this different looking river tile, it creates a land bridge. Once we do that, we can walk across it and into a hidden dwarven town. I couldn't remember what weapons the blacksmith here actually made, and sadly the answer is ones that are even with or worse than those that my main characters are already using. I could have come here a bit earlier, but the situation would have been pretty much the same. You can give the good weapons you make to weaker characters if you decide to do that, and uh, if you want to try to raise anyone up, that can help out with that. So overall, this was a pretty disappointing visit, but I wanted to make sure you could see pretty much everything there is in the game, so there we are. Now it's time to move on, so let's head back to the evil statue. When we go in, we're confronted with this maze. You can go up or down stairs, but you can only go down the ramps. It's a little annoying, but at least there's no fight here or anything, so once you figure it out, you're done with this place. You'll have to do a bit of back and forth, but the best advice I can give you is if you're stuck, to look for the areas you can't reach and try to trace back to where you can find stairs that lead to them. After that, we exit north into our next battle with the greater devil Adai and his army. The game kind of ruins the reveal here, probably again something lost in translation, but it turns out that Adai is Adler, the blind boy we found earlier near Bedo. He'd been knocked senseless before he wandered into town earlier, and had accompanied Bowie in the Shining Force for a while, before we dropped him off at Creed's mansion. Adai tells us to just leave the jewels of light and darkness, or die. Well, we can't just leave them here, of course, so die it is. I, I mean, battle. The gimmick to this battle is all the squares on the map are artificial. For the first few turns, some of them vanish, cutting off paths you may have been traveling. As far as the battle goes, it's not especially hard. The enemies are definitely tough, and if you're using Kiwi, you want to especially keep an eye on his HP. Just put your best practices to use here. At this point, if you're playing along, you'll know what you're doing. At the end, we defeat 
Adai. Sadly, he tells us how much he truly enjoyed traveling with us, and our friendship during his time with the Force. And then, he dies. See ya! Oh, you may be tempted to go back at this point to revive characters and save. Don't! If you do that, you'll have to redo the maze again. Instead, just proceed upwards. So next we go into the ancient tower a bit, and hey look, there's Creed! Creed wants to help us out, and since there are no churches or priests in the area, he offers to serve as a priest for us here. That's why I told you to move on. Revive anyone, save, whatever, and then exit to the south. Once you do, you'll be in the next battle on the outside of the tower. This battle has sort of a mini gimmick to it. This is one battle where you'll want to pull up the mini map in the game, which I haven't even done at any point before. You do that by moving the cursor off of your characters, opening the menu, and then selecting the left map option. There are enemies behind many of the columns on the outside of the tower, and powerful ones at that. You can't see them because the columns obscure them. So be prepared to deal with them, and don't send any weaker characters out in front after clearing off enemies on any of the sets of stairs. Also, watch out for the demons here. They have bolt level 2, which has an area of effect radius of 2, so it can hit all your characters at once if you're in a bad formation. Oh, and the demon masters here have freeze level 4, which will do between 50 and 60 damage to a character. So try to stay out of their range until you can move some powerful, high HP characters in for the kill. This one is a little bit tough because of how hard the enemies are, and expect at least a few of your characters to die. But once the battle is over, you can just go back to Creed, revive, and save, or regress from the next fight if you don't feel like walking. Okay, here we go, folks. We're pretty much in the end game now. There are only two fights left, both of which take place on this map. The first one has very powerful enemies, and the boss of the map is the possessed King Galam. Well, now we know what happened to both him and the princess earlier, since Princess Ellis is also here. The plan is to make her the first sacrifice to Zeon after he finishes reviving. Hey, we don't want that, so let's put a stop to it, shall we? And no, your eyes don't deceive you. That indeed does look an awful lot like the famous painting The Scream all over the floor. The key thing to be aware of in this battle is don't move your characters too far to the north in the center of the map. That will cause King Galam to come out and he'll slaughter you. Very carefully advance up the sides, taking out all of the enemies and isolating King Galam. King Galam has a nasty attack called Demon Breath that's area of effect and does about 40 or so damage to most characters. Try and get a few whacks in with all of your powerful characters while there are only one or two enemies on the map. Why? Because if you take out all of the enemies except the king, a bunch more start spawning in. Unless you really want the experience from fighting them, I suggest trying to ignore them and focus on Galam now since defeating him ends the battle. Alternatively, you can go straight for him at the start of the battle, but that makes for a much harder fight. Once you beat Galam, Princess Ellis wakes from her sleep and wonders what's going on. The princess and Bowie have an awkward private moment before things start shaking. Oh, what's causing this? Astral finally realizes, oh yeah, there was that whole Zeon character to worry about. Zeon finally makes his appearance in person. He seems to eat King Galam's body. Zeon threatens the Shining Force. Astral gets scared and says we should all run away. But Peter says they can't because Ellis passed out. Ugh. On to battle, sort of. You can egress and revive anyone you need to, and you'll come back at the start of this phase of the battle. And I do that in this video and recommend that you do too, unless you have no dead characters. Once you start this battle, this is it. The final battle in all of Shining Force 2. And except for the boss, it's actually pretty easy. The boss Zeon, however, is especially nasty. You want to take out the enemies on the fringes of the southern end of the map to prevent them from attacking your main force with area of effect spells. The arch demons have bolt level 3, which is not fun to get hit by. Also, you can reach Zeon either by going straight up the middle or from the left side of the map, but not the right. However, you should still send a few strong characters up the right side of the map to take out the enemies there, including the Zeon guards that look and function like the prison flowers we were introduced to not so long ago. Once we clear out all the enemies here, we're good to concentrate on Zeon himself. Zeon has the same demon breath attack that Galam had earlier, with a radius of 2 for its area of effect. Also, his turn occurs very often. He gets to go twice per turn also, but each action is generally staggered a little bit. So take it slow with Zeon, there's no need to rush. Keep your characters far enough apart that you don't need to worry about Demon Breath hitting more than one of them at a time. What I recommend here is making sure you have at least one healer and three or four strong fighters left at this point. For me, Bowie and Peter basically took turns hitting Zeon, while one of the healers took care of whoever wasn't attacking. So remember that heal three costs three times as many magic points as heal one does, but only heals twice as many hit points. So I would suggest slowly healing with heal one 
in order to make sure you don't run out of magic points. Or if you've got some magic point restoratives, you can use them and then use heal 3. If you've been leveling up Peter, he should be able to do between 60 and 70 damage to Zeon per hit. Make sure to take care of Peter. Eventually, you'll land the final blow, and Zeon will be defeated. Once Zeon is taken out, King Golom shows back up, lying on the floor, seemingly near death. He asks where he is, what happened, and stuff like that. He asks if he's dying. Golom asks Lemon what happened and why he's dying. Lemon can't bring himself to answer. Princess Ellis is awake now, and does her best to comfort the king, and explains everything. He asks her to come close so he can look at her. She does so and leans down next to the dying king. Then Galam springs up and grabs Ellis, threatening to pull her into the darkness with him. Galam laughs and it turns out, no, this is not Galam at all, but Zeon himself. Zeon can't be killed, remember? Only weakened. Astral suddenly remembers that Metula told the Force to summon her and Volcanon when Zeon was weakened so they could seal him away. Lemon won't tolerate Zeon's deception and demands that Zeon let the princess go. Zeon ignores him and tells Peter to remove the jewel of darkness slash evil from Bowie. Peter starts to say that he can't. Zeon tells him to do it anyway, and hey, this time Peter's able to take it off Bowie. Peter is surprised to find he can remove it and places the jewel on the ground near Zeon. As Zeon flashes and starts to regain his power, Astral calls out in vain for the help of Metula and Volcanon. Zeon taunts the Force, saying he'll be fully revived in a matter of minutes. He casts an evil spell on poor Ellis that puts her to sleep. Yeesh, that girl just can't catch a break. After that, Zeon starts burning Lemon to a crisp, saying that this fire can kill even vampires. Peter and Astral rush Zeon, who knocks them both very far away. Bowie manages to slap the Jewel of Evil away from Zeon. Zeon returns the favor by slapping Bowie so hard that the little guy flies down the hall and can't get back up. Suddenly, a shining light emanates from Bowie and removes the fire from Lemon, who is miraculously unharmed. Lemon tells Zeon he'll leave, but he's taking him with him. Zeon tries to burn Lemon again, but once more, the shining light emanates from Bowie and douses the flames. Zeon realizes his powers are no longer restoring because the Jewel of Evil is in the corner of the room. Lemon grabs Zeon and pulls him back into the darkness. Ah, there goes Lemon, a stand-up guy. Have a good afterlife, Lemon. Bowie, Peter, and Astral try to wake up Princess Ellis, but it's no use. She's alive, but in a deep sleep from the evil spell. Suddenly, Metula shows up to let us know that Ellis is in a coma. Metula lets the group know that she and Volcanon have been watching and helping the whole time. Astral and Peter ask what Volcanon actually did. Metula lets them know it was Volcanon's power that saved Lemon and put the fire out. Peter brings up that Volcanon basically told us to go fuck ourselves earlier. Matula said that was a ruse to throw off Zeon, because if Zeon realized Volcanon was actually helping the Shining Force, he would have attacked Parmesia much more forcefully, and many more people would have died. Astral realizes that it was Volcanon who made the Jewel of Light, and that was what protected Lemon. Matula collects both jewels and tells us she has to seal Zeon quickly, and that all of Ark Valley will collapse and we should skedaddle. Astral asks how they can save Princess Ellis. Matula tells him that Ellis is poisoned. Once the poison leaves her body, her face will turn pink. If she doesn't awaken after her face turns pink, the only thing that will wake her is a kiss from her true love. Astral asks how long it will take for the poison to dissipate. Matula says she doesn't know. It depends on how strong Ellis is. It could be months or even years. Bowie picks up Ellis and the Shining Force escapes the tower. Then we see two years have passed. Two years! But good news! We learn that Ellis's face has turned pink, but she's still asleep, so she'll need that kiss now. We can wander around the town and talk to people now to get some backstory filled in, like they're building a statue to commemorate Lemon. Apparently, a straw is the one who will decide who kisses Princess Ellis to attempt to wake her up. If you talk to your pals here, it's clear that Sarah has a thing for Bowie and is hoping that a straw won't pick him to kiss Ellis. We talk to Astral, and then head to the castle. Here we bear witness to what I can only describe as some horrible racism. When Astral and the king decide it should be Bowie that kisses Ellis, Jaha objects because he says he loves her. They tell him, sorry, but you're a dwarf. Because she's a human girl, she should be with a human boy. Because they're both humans, they'll make such a cute couple. Astral asks Sarah for her opinion. She slowly and reluctantly admits Bowie will make Ellis happy, and then runs out of the room crying. Chester realizes it's because she loves Bowie. Kazin says he'll go comfort her. Chester offers to go with him, but Kazin stops Chester, saying she needs someone like him, which is just more racism. Poor, pure Chester just doesn't understand at all what Kazin meant, which is maybe the saddest part of the entire ending. At least centaurs apparently aren't raised racists. 
Estral admits this all went down exactly like he'd expected. He was hoping to not hurt anyone's feelings, and didn't know for sure how they'd all react. The king reiterates that he chooses Bowie, and tells him to go talk to the minister, and then go kiss his daughter already. If you talk to Jaha, he's apparently already over it, or at least, he's putting on a brave face. We head up to the princess's room and talk to the minister, who says he'll be happy if Bowie and Ellis rule together. He then tells Bowie to kiss her. You have to stand on the left side of the bed to get the option to kiss Ellis. Bowie leans in, and we get a nice close-up picture of him kissing the sleeping princess, which isn't at all creepy, no sorry, Bob. Hi, Bob. Don't f***ing hi, Bob me. Then the credits roll, but we're not quite done yet, so stick around. We see a quick little scene where Bowie and the princess pop in to see the king in a stroll. A bunch of their friends show up and are happy to see them. Then the scene transitions back to the old witch stirring the pot that greets us whenever we start or continue a game. She says she finally fulfilled her wish and she can escape from the forest. And she returns to her original young and attractive form. Whoa, is she actually Matula? Mind blown! The jewels of light and evil drop down as she vanishes, so who else could it be, right? Maybe sealing away Zeon took a toll on her and she just recovered. And finally, that's the end of the game. It had a much more satisfying ending than any of the previous Shining Force games up to this point. You know, except for all that racism against dwarves and centaurs. Phew, okay, that was a long one, but there was a lot of story this time around. So here's my mini-review. Shining Force 2 is a fantastic strategy RPG, and instead of being one of the best games in the genre on 16-bit consoles, it makes a strong case for being named THE best game in the genre on 16-bit consoles. It addresses nearly every shortcoming from the first game. It looks better, it sounds better, it plays better, it's faster, there's more to do, there's more optional content, there are way more characters, and the whole structure of the game is more RPG-like since you can freely roam around much of the world map. Now this playthrough took me roughly 23 hours, which feels just about right, although it would have been nice to have had a few more optional areas. It's really kind of astounding just how much more there is to this game than the first Shining Force, considering it's only a measly 512 kilobytes larger than the original. The minor negatives I can mention here are the translation is a bit lackluster, turning some events into a bit of a jumbled mess, and there are some user interface foibles that could have been addressed. Namely, when you're at the bottom of the character list, you should be able to press down to wrap to the top of the list, but you can't. You have to slowly scroll back up. Also, some of the translation issues make figuring out what to do with certain optional stuff a little bit harder than it should be. Finally, having to sometimes press the A button to open the menu to search things instead of using the C button context shortcut, which happens like two or three times throughout, was just a major oversight that should have been corrected. In the end though, the flaws in Shining Force 2 are small, and the rest of the game is just so good it's easy to overlook them. I give Shining Force 2 a 9 out of 10. All I can say at this point is if you like RPGs or strategy RPGs, you should play this game. It may be the best in the whole series as far as the overall experience. You can play Shining Force 2 today in many different ways. You can use an original cartridge, of course, or you can use emulation. It's in a bunch of Genesis collections. It's on the Nintendo eShop for the Switch. It's also part of the Nintendo Switch Online expansion pack right now, at least as I record this. And it's also included in the Genesis slash Mega Drive 2 Mini. Note, it is on the 2 Mini, not the original Genesis or Mega Drive Mini, which only has the first game. So in the next episode of the Shining Force Retrospective, I'll be covering the first remake in this series, Shining Force CD, which includes remakes of Shining Force Gaiden 1 and 2. But don't skip it, because there's some new stuff too, and it's really worth taking a look at this game as a whole. Now that video will be a little bit shorter too, since I won't need to cover the entire plot of each game. That episode will be up in a few weeks. So that's it for Shining Force 2. What did you think, my retro gaming friends? Have you played it? Do you think it's the best game in the series? Did it just not click with you? I'd love to hear about your experiences with the game in the comments. And that'll do it for this video, my retro gaming friends. If you enjoyed it, please like and share it online somewhere. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you won't miss any of my videos. If you want to support the work that I do here, you can now do that through Patreon, Ko-fi, or even channel memberships. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.